honored listeners. Eight days ago I described the structure of the region that everyone must pass through who enters the condition between two incarnations, the so-called kingdom of the mental kingdom or the world of Devakan. I spoke of the three regions we must distinguish there. I also remarked that the words that we have at our disposal in ordinary language are insufficient to describe the perceptions in the mental kingdom. As a result, we must often use symbols, or we are in a position to offer only an indication of what is to be perceived by a person when passing through this country during the time between two incarnations. Those who, as initiates, know about this country, describe it in words that are more an indication than strictly corresponding to reality. For this reason you should take the descriptions that I gave last time more as indications. What those experience whose sense for the world of Devakan has been opened is almost inexpressible. I presented three regions of Devakan and commented that these three correspond to the three regions on our earth, the solid mountainous, that is the continental region of Devakan, the fluid region, that is the ocean region of Devakan, and the region of the sea of air. As I said last time, Goethe was one of the German poets who knew something of this land. Goethe had his Mephistopheles describe this country more outwardly, and already with this description you can see that Goethe knew how difficult it is to speak of this land. He described it by having Mephistopheles draw Faust's attention to what he would find there. Mephistopheles said the following, quote, And if to ocean's end swimming your path should lead, to look upon enormity of space, still would you see that waves to waves succeed. Even though you have a shuddering doom to face, you'd still see something in the green of silenced depth are gliding dolphin seen. Still cloud will stir and sun and moon and star. You will see nothing in the distances of the eternal void. You will not hear your own step. You will not find anything solid to stand upon. Close quote. Those who read this with understanding will be able to see this as an approximate description of this kingdom. In another passage, Mephistopheles says to Faust, quote, Here, take this key. The key will scent the true path from all others. Follow it down. It will guide you to the mothers. Close quote. The kingdom of the mothers was also spoken of at the time of Plutarch. For Goethe, this is the kingdom of what has not yet come into being. For this reason, he has Mephisto say to Faust, quote, Descend then to the depths. I could just as well say ascend to the heights. Flee from what has taken on form in existence, into the kingdom unfettered by forms. Rejoice in things that long have ceased from being. Close quote. That is a description given by a European. Now I will also give you the description from a Hindu sage. It is colored in an Eastern way, although expressing the same contents. It says, quote, there are many thousands of world systems. This world has a kingdom of blessedness as its foundation. The kingdoms are bound by seven rows of fences. They are ruled by the Tathagata and belong to the Bodhisattvas. Close quote. Water flows through these kingdoms and they have seven characteristics. I have described three kingdoms of Devakan that correspond to our solid land, our oceans, and the sea of air. I have said that the land of Devakan appears different from our land, and I have said that we find forms there that we also see here. However, they are engraved like the imprint of a seal. This continental land mass forms the basic foundation of Devakan. 
a lively mass of ocean, is in movement within this landmass. It permeates all being with a rose color and forms the life source of all forms, all shapes that are to come into existence, such as plants, animals, and human beings. In Devakan, the atmosphere has a very special character. We see our physical atmosphere is blue. The atmosphere in Devakan is a radiant reddish color. It has an extremely sensitive ability to feel and sense, which resides in every atom and souls every single atom. The active force of everything in the atmosphere has a life of feeling. Everything experienced as pain or desire in the lower kingdoms is expressed in the atmosphere of Devakan. Those who can perceive at this level understand what the initiate of Christian religion, Paul, said, quote, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Close quote. Additionally, the atmosphere is permeated by a music that the ancient Pythagorean called music of the spheres. Those who have already heard this music, which is an expression of this harmony of the cosmos, can hear it everywhere, even when it is drowned out by the noise of everyday life. In the expression of a Hindu wise person, this is described as fences. Now we come to the fourth region of the kingdom of spirit. This is a very special kingdom. The creators of all things and the beings who ensoul all things are at work there. So-called akashic matter is the substance, the clay, from which everything is formed. All magicians speak of this picture. Goethe also speaks of this, where he speaks of fire air. It is the matter that has the greatest plasticity, the matter that can be imprinted both by the spirit and by material shapes. This is the matter that has been unknown since the beginning of Christendom, and that remained unknown until the Theosophical Society appeared. When the first call went out to Senate to make this knowledge known to the Western world, we hear in his book a description of this matter, which is supposed to contain magical forces. We read there, as a master himself expresses it, that a cultured person from the West will come to understand the significance of this Akashic matter only slowly and with great difficulty. As I described eight days ago, the Devakonic world can be divided into three higher kingdoms and three lower kingdoms. The three higher kingdoms shine and sound forth into the three lower kingdoms. We characterized the three lower Devakonic kingdoms, called Rupa kingdoms, in the language of theosophy as solid land, ocean, and an atmosphere of air. The three higher kingdoms extend on the other side of the fourth kingdom, Akasha, the origin of everything found on this side of Devakan, that is the astral kingdom and physical kingdom, is found in higher Devakan. This Arupa kingdom is inhabited by beings of the loftiest nature. The masters of original Christian wisdom were still able to describe this kingdom. This wisdom was still known in Christian wisdom until the 13th century. Then the knowledge was lost. No one understands the Christian wisdom of earlier centuries who doesn't understand that the three highest kingdoms of Devakan are described in those writings. These three kingdoms are, as stated, inhabited by the loftiest beings who guide and lead all the processes in the lower kingdoms. Goethe also points to the first step of Upper Devakan in a passage from titled The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily. You can read there, quote, What is more profound than light? Conversation, close quote. This is one of the most profound statements made by Goethe. From the kingdom of light in Devakan arises the so-called kingdom of conversation. This is the kingdom in which not only light but also a stream of knowledge as light flows forth. The higher beings speak eternal truths through this stream within human beings. The conversation of the cosmos speaks through this stream. Here we rise to the higher kingdoms in which the words for this conversation are produced. 
In these kingdoms the voice sounds forth in which the origin of the world is found. Human beings refer to this voice as the word, from which worlds have come forth. There are a number of lofty beings living in the kingdom of conversation. In the Christian tradition they are called exousiae. These are beings difficult to characterize using expressions from the Western world. These beings become visible in the garment of the light of knowledge. I have often pointed out that one such being appeared to Moses in the burning bush. That passage in the Bible indicates an exousiae. The garment of these beings is woven from the matter found in this kingdom. These beings then become visible and proclaim the truth to those who are mature enough to hear them. We will now ascend to still higher regions. There we find beings that can no longer become visible. However, they can still speak to human beings when humans are mature enough. The first teachers of Christian wisdom called them dunamis. These are beings that radiate as creative powers. In the next hierarchy we find the dominions, the curiotities. With these three we have the hierarchies of lofty beings that sound forth in the three highest kingdoms of Devakan. In Christian esotericism, there is much that indicates that this knowledge was still alive in the first centuries of Christendom. However, it was lost because there were ever fewer Christian initiates. There are also beings in the kingdom that I previously described as the atmosphere of Devakan, whose garment is woven from the atmosphere of Devakan, but who have entirely opposite characteristics from what we human beings possess. The characteristics of these beings living in the atmosphere of Devakan are difficult to describe. We human beings ascribe sensations and feelings to ourselves. However, we must ascribe to these beings that they do not receive feelings coming toward them, but that they carry feelings and sensations out into the atmosphere. They are thus beings of an entirely different sort. Wherever they go, they radiate forth the forces of feeling and sensation, while we human beings receive feelings and sensations that stream into us. Only in this way can I characterize these beings. In Christian esotericism, this was expressed by calling these beings archangeloi. Today this expression is no longer understood. It is not permitted for this expression to be used for physical powers. That would be superstition. It must be used for devakonic beings that carry the message of sensation and feeling through the atmosphere of devakon and spread pure feeling and sensation everywhere. The ocean of Devakan is comparable to a rosy-colored stream that is poured over everything. It is enlivened by a series of beings that are characterized as messengers, as angeloi. These do not carry sensation and feeling. They carry life through the kingdom of Devakan. They are bearers of life. In the solid kingdom, the kingdom of continents of Devakan is enlivened and ensouled by beings that in Christian esotericism are called Archai. The lower kingdom of Devakan, the solid kingdom, the continental kingdom, is enlivened by these Archai. They are the ones who breathe life into everything. These beings are called in Christian esotericism the hierarchies of the Archai, the archangels and the angels. They are met by every human being whose devakonic senses have been opened and by every human being who has died and is passing through the time between two incarnations. I have already pointed out that human beings, when they have set aside their body, must spend time in the astral world. I will return to this. Now I would like to tell you about what happens in this world where human beings become mature enough to step into the world of Devakan. Everything we bring with us from the physical world of nature is cleansed away by the forces of Kama in the astral world. Even the so-called feeling for oneself is slowly dissolved in the astral world. All chaotic forces are loosened when we enter into Devakan. 
I will mention again the four higher kingdoms of the astral kingdom, which could also be called the strata of sympathy. They are filled with a fine astral substance, with the substance of sympathy, in contrast to the substance of egotism found in the lower three steps. In the fourth kingdom, egotism is dissolved. In the fifth, the pleasure from the senses is dissolved. In this fifth part of the astral kingdom, we learn to admire the beauty of the world, not because it is pleasant, but rather because everything that is pure and eternal should be beautiful. And in the sixth astral kingdom, we learn the deeper powers of compassion, of goodwill, of devotion to the world. In the seventh kingdom, all the remaining life that we have brought from the lower regions is melted away like snow and sunlight. And then we will have to pass through the four lower steps of Devakan, which I described previously. Life on these four steps has an enormous significance. I have said that the archetypal powers, the Archai, are to be found in this first kingdom of Devakan. We come into contact with them here. Here we find disembodied souls gathering new forces for their later life. Everything that held us together with ethnic blood ties, national groupings, in short, everything that points more or less to blood ties within the human race, all of this is spiritualized in this kingdom of Archai, so that we can be purified by what we have learned and are able to be endowed with higher capacities. The meaning of the kingdom of Devakan is simply this. We pass through it so that what we learned during our earthly life can be formed into higher capacities. In the physical world, we should gather experiences that are then transformed into abilities. We should emerge from the school of life improved and strengthened. Then we move into the second region of Devakan. The ocean of Devakan is what connects everything together. Just as water connects all the land in the world, so in Devakan the flowing rose-colored water connects everything that has boundaries in the lower kingdoms. Wherever there are families, tribes, clans, ethnic groups or countries, boundaries are erected. These boundaries must exist, but at the same time, the fact is that we all belong together. The harmony of all beings must be established. These beings must find themselves together in the river that flows through everything. When we enter into this river, we then enjoy the fruits of every seed we have ever sown. There each one of us will find what elevates us above the boundaries of existence. We are cleansed of the boundaries that must of necessity cling to us within the earthly region. We are led to acquire new capacities, new abilities. Indeed, they are merely seeds, but the flowers that will come forth from them are the abilities we create for ourselves and then carry with us into our new lives. The third region is what I have described as the atmosphere in Devakan. We enter into this atmosphere during life between two incarnations. In that place where the sighs of nature can be heard, where every thunder evokes pain, where sunlight corresponds to what we call eternal bliss and joy, in that place is created what we call a sense for philanthropy, for noble humanity, for the next incarnation. This is where active devotion, understanding devotion, and daily love arise. And this is the plant that above all flourishes here and that we develop within ourselves. Here we see the fruits of what we experienced in the egotistical world. Here we become active working beings. We become human beings who truly know in the highest sense the meaning of the words humanity and philanthropy. Then the fourth kingdom comes, Akasha. This is the kingdom where all existence sounds forth. Here we learn to recognize what gives form and shape in world existence to beings and things. Here we learn how tone is linked to tone in a symphony, how the forces of nature are connected to other forces of nature and are transformed into, in quotes, instruments. Here we come to know the beings that discover and invent. Here we get to know not only the forces as such, but we come to know them as living beings. Here we are permeated by the living productive power 
to create. Here we come to know what is created as expressions of human existence, what is created in terms of human institutions that enliven humanity, and what is suitable for human life. We also learn to recognize what belongs to the area of the higher arts. In all this life are laws that are experienced in Akasha as living beings. When we immerse ourselves in the light of this experience, we are immersing ourselves in the fourth kingdom of Devakan, in the ways in which weaving takes place, quote, on the rushing loom of time, close quote. That is what we learn there. Those are the four steps in which we live through what we prepared for ourselves in our previous earthly life in order to create new capacities. When we have passed through this fourth kingdom, a very important moment has come. We are placed into the other side of our world system, into the actual kingdom of the spirit, into the kingdom where impressions are formed, quote, from the other side, close quote. We can spend only a short time there. Only those who have already attained a higher stage of evolution can stay there longer. Human beings who have not yet evolved have only a brief moment of enlightenment in these higher kingdoms, in order then to descend again into the deeper regions, to gather experiences and return again. Then they spend longer and longer periods there. When we enter this kingdom again, the abilities are developed that had been limited by the world of matter previously. I am calling this an important moment because what had been held together earlier by matter is now completely set aside, removed. What had been narrow before is now wide. What had been entangled and interwoven before is now developed. It becomes fluid. The human being becomes free. Our capacities are no longer constricted by matter. We can compare this state with a plant that cannot grow freely but must grow in the crevice between two boulders and adapt its form to the shape of the crevice. It grows up but is constricted by the crevice. The same holds true for the human soul. Assume the stone around the crevice becomes softer and softer so that the plant can unfold itself a little more. When the human soul enters into the Akasha kingdom, it finds absolute equality. To those whose devakonic eye, EYE, has been opened, it is wonderful to see how the soul is developed when transitioning out of the Akasha kingdom into the higher kingdoms of Devakan. We see the soul as a fine etheric substance in the middle of an egg or spherical hovering substance. It sets aside sheath after sheath. The fine color of the sheath of the Akasha is set aside, and the pure being itself unfolds radiant in a new light, in a light that cannot be described in earthly words. It gets an entirely free form. Every capacity that was constricted in earthly life and was not completely free, even in the kingdom of lower Devakan, is now free. It can now bring all of its capacities into full growth. The more a human being develops abilities, the more he or she expands, and the more he or she takes along into the next incarnation. As long as such souls are permitted to dwell there, they make the acquaintance of the masters of wisdom and compassion. This is the kingdom where they are permitted, through grace, to receive from even loftier beings the purposes and the intentions at the foundation of the cosmos. They weave the gown of the world from here, the garment that is woven from the material of the lower Devakan kingdom, from the astral kingdom and from the kingdom of earthly substances. There, above the intentions, the outlines of cosmic evolution are created. Here, those who have developed their abilities in the course of evolution can get to know the threefold sequence of steps that I have enumerated. In the first sphere of higher Devakan, they learn from the beings who have ascended to be exousiae, who know the wonderful blossom that swells forth from the seeds of the universe. They learn how they grow. They get to know the eternal forces of the universe. In this sphere, they meet the beings who have the power of thought. 
they see how a thought works through them. The next higher sphere hosts the beings called dunamis. They have not only the power of thought, but also the power to be a source of thought. They are beings that have the seeds for thoughts. Compare the exousiae with flowers. Now imagine a seed that is transparent, bright, and clear, but also has the power to become a flower. Thus, through these beings, a seed of thought can be formed, and then from the other side, the entire thought can be built into the akasha, that is, the sound, so to speak, or of the entire fabric of the world. As Goethe described this in Faust, this is where forms are created, where the mothers sit on their thrones in loneliness and work at their glowing tripod. As I already said, in Plutarch's time this kingdom was also called the kingdom of the mothers. If you read about the kingdom of the mothers in Plutarch, this story will reveal an entirely new meaning. The beings we call curiosities sound forth in the highest kingdom. Only the most highly developed human beings can gain even a brief glimpse into this kingdom. Everything is harmony and unity there. All exception has disappeared. The exousiae, the dunamis, the curiosities are the three highest kingdoms in which human abilities are completely free. These are the kingdoms we enter in the time between two incarnations in order to find forces from what lies on the other side, for work we must do on this side of world existence. What happens on this side of existence, what we do ourselves, this is the world of results, the world of action. New forces for existence flow to us from the world of causes when we return to a new incarnation. Everything that we do in this world that rises into our soul as moral ideals, as ability to work creatively, as daily love for fellow human beings, everything that occurs to us for mastering the forces of nature in technology, all this resides hidden deeply in the human soul. The soul brought it from the kingdom of higher Devakan, where the initiatives for work on this side of the threshold are found. Goethe points to this in a wonderful way in his fairy tale, The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily, where he speaks of the river, we can compare it to the river of Akasha, and the beach on the far side, calling the garden on the far side the beautiful lily's flower. The reports from the Hindu wise men also speak of such flowers. It is the power that flows through all of Devakan. The fruits from this flower are the archetypes for this world of earth. If human beings want to work, then they must obtain strength from the nourishment of this fruit. Then they evolve and develop. They become active and full of strength. As I said, theosophy should not draw us away from the world. It does not want to move us into a kingdom in which we would become weak and languid for earthly existence. This it does not want to do. It wants to do something entirely different. It wants to point us to a kingdom in which we can receive strength and abilities so that we are strong and able to do our work in earthly existence. People who do not know what lies both behind them and before them are like the blind, who can only stumble around and do not know in what direction they are stumbling and what they are bumping into. And a person who can see is someone who knows the way forward and backward. The particular beings that we also meet there will be the object of the next lectures. We will hear still more about our entire life in Devakan, also about individual experiences, and about how the world of Devakan works into our world. From these introductory lectures it should be clear that theosophy is not alienated from reality, but is rather a teaching full of creative joy and saturated with reality. It does not take people away from earthly existence, but rather equips them with forces that live in earthly existence but are not visible. You must know this if you are striving upward into the kingdoms that are inaccessible to those who cling to the physical world only. To all those people who are enemies of the spiritual kingdoms, all those who say that there is nothing on the other side of the world of the senses, 
To those we wish to respond with the words of Goethe, quote, Well, let us always move forward. We'll plumb and search the depths. For in your nothing, I hope to find the all. Close quote. When the ideas concerning the actual spiritual world, so-called Devakan, that theosophy seeks to awaken, are held to be totally improbable, then we can respond that when a theosophist points to these higher worlds that exist beyond our world of the senses, it is not anything new or at all alien. In order to guide our thoughts somewhat more deeply into this world of Devakan, today I would like to begin my lecture with the words of a German thinker, well known to you all, who exerted a great influence on his time, and who knew how to speak of higher worlds, not in any dreamy way, but rather who knew how to intervene in the events of his time through the power and the fire of his words, Johann Gottlieb Fichte. We all know the power he drew from the suprasensory world, the power that made his fiery speech overflow. With this speech he inspired the youth of his time to participate in the events that were necessary at that time. We know his book titled Address to the German Nation. His introductory lectures were a deed that does not belong in a dreamy world, but rather belongs to immediate reality. As he held these introductory lectures into the science of knowledge, Johann Gottlieb Fichte presented them as the ripe fruit of his research and meditation. He began them with the following sentence, This teaching presupposes the existence of an entirely new inner sensory instrument through which a new world is opened up, a world that simply does not exist for the ordinary person. This should not be understood as an exaggeration, a rhetorical phrase said only to demand much with a quiet modesty, so that less may be granted, it is rather to be understood literally, as it stands. Close quote. Fichte introduced this view of the suprasensory world at a time when no one had thought of a theosophical society, with words that indicate that he is going to impart information from a sense organ or instrument that is not present in ordinary people. In the same series of lectures, he explained further, quote, Imagine a world of people all born blind. They can know about the existence and interrelationships of things that exist only for the sense of touch. If you talk to them about colors and about other relationships that exist only through light and the sense of sight, you might as well be saying nothing at all. Or for some reason or another they want to give your teaching a meaning, then they would be able to understand your teaching through what they know through the sense of touch. Close quote. There would be an entirely new situation if someone born blind could begin to see through an operation. This comparison is correct with respect to higher vision. What is not expressed by Fichte is that actually everyone has this instrument and need only develop it. One needs only a good will in order to have the spiritual world revealed. Everyone who is spiritually blind can be given vision. This must be stressed so that it is clear that the spiritual world can become accessible to everyone who wishes to seek it. The information given about that world is intended only to point to what will be given later. The first step is to receive a description of the spiritual world. As theosophists know, it is a path to receive a first insight through description of that world. We are dealing here with a world that is not located in any other place in the cosmos, but rather a world that everywhere surrounds us, which is present everywhere around us. The spiritual world is present at every point of our world at the same time. When we speak of the spiritual world of Devakan, we are not wandering around in a different world but rather it is an opening of organs of perception, the achievement of another state of mind. One could object that such a state in a human being is something extraordinary, that it is not possible to form any idea of that state, and that nothing similar can be shown in the life of a human being. 
but this is not correct. The rest of life continues to flow calmly past without any radical revolution. As a matter of fact, however, a transition does take place once in a person's life that is similar to the change that makes a person with physical senses into a seer, but we are unaware of it. Everyone sitting here has already gone through a similar radical revolution in his or her consciousness at least once in life. We must think of life beginning not just when we first see the light of the external world, but from the moment of conception. If we observe human beings from their very first phase in the body of the mother, then everyone has experienced such a revolution. The state of consciousness of an embryo, its ability to perceive, is entirely different from that of a human being later. Those who know how to observe this know the important things that happen to human beings in the first months of existence before birth. They know that the human ability to perceive is radically changed already with birth. An embryo has an ability to perceive that is essentially different from that of a human being who has seen the light of the world and developed a wakeful consciousness. An embryo perceives in a way that we characterize as an astral capacity to perceive. Thus the human embryo has an astral perception. Wakeful consciousness is developed only later. The human being evolves from an astral life to a conscious life. The opening of the so-called devakonic senses that are bestowed upon a seer so that he or she can perceive a new world is a change similar to that at birth. An embryo perceives, as a matter of fact, the dark streams in the astral world. It perceives the emotions holding sway in its environment. You can see this in the influences exerted on the embryo by the conditions present in the womb. This transition or changeover from an astral consciousness in the embryo to a wakeful consciousness in the world of the senses occurs in every human being. The new condition of consciousness opened for us is thus the world in which we live. We cannot at first understand what we perceive in this world. We are guided, step by step, to perception in the world of Devakan or spirit. Our perception of Devakan is the same as with a child when its senses are opened in the first days of life. A world opens for us that is at first not understandable. It announces itself in glittering color tones and in a sequence of varying sounds. At first we do not know how to interpret these colors and sounds that do not belong to our physical world, that are essentially different from the colors and sounds of our physical world. We can interpret them only when we have come to know their meanings and connections. Those who enter this world with no guidance often have no idea how to orient themselves. It sometimes happens that the devakonic sense is suddenly opened for someone. Such a person would then roam confused around in this world of spiritual existence. Learning the meaning of these phenomena is possible only for those who are led into this world by a person who is already a seer, who can introduce them methodically into this spiritual world. Students then learn how to organize and combine the sequence of sounds and colors, just as we combine consonants and vowels into meaningful words. The sounds and colors of the spiritual world appear to us as consonants and vowels, and when we find out what the consonants and vowels signify, we achieve the ability to spell and read. We discover that a certain kind of being that lives in the spiritual world manifests itself to us through the language of these colors and sounds. This is the training offered to the cellas, the students, who are to enter these higher worlds in order to participate in these higher truths. We then learn that the appearance of colors, sounds, and forms is not an accident, but that what appears to us there is the expression of spiritual beings whose language we perceive. When we have learned to know and read the letters, then an entirely new world is open to us. 
I have indicated that a world lower than the Devakonic world is integrated into our physical world, a world that we get to know first. That is the astral world. At times it blends together with the world of Devakon. For a while, at the beginning, one cannot exactly distinguish what belongs to the astral world and what belongs to the Devakonic world. Only gradually do we learn how to distinguish them. Using an example, today I would like to show how one can learn to distinguish between what belongs to the astral world and what is of the Devakonic world, the spiritual world, which is our actual home. The human being we encounter in the physical world is only a part of the human being. The truth is that for a seer, human beings are beings with entirely other sides to their existence than those that appear to physical eyes. I am speaking of what is known as the human aura. The human aura is something that is essential to the whole human being. In the eighth installment of title Lucifer, I described in an introductory fashion part of this human aura. It is something that appears to a seer just as the ordinary physical form appears to human physical eyes. The physical form is merely the middle part of the human being, which rests in an oval-shaped, foggy cloud, so to speak. This foggy cloud, the aura, belongs to the human body of spirit just as it belongs to the physical human being. The cloud is much larger than the physical human being. On average, it is twice as long and three to four times as wide. Light forms and color forms of the most varied kind appear to the eyes of a seer as a continuation of the physical body. The aura of a human being, this body of light, does not appear as an indefinite, more or less organized cloud of colors, but as kind of a mirror or imprint of what is going on in the human being. The passions, instincts, drives of a human being are imprinted in this aura. Everything we call inner life is imprinted within. The physics of the present time should find all this very understandable when we speak of this phenomenon. What do physicists say? They present vibrating movements of the ether. This vibrating movement is transformed into colors in the external world. It is the same with our inner world. There are instincts, drives, and passions within us. They go forth from every human being who stands in front of us. And just as color is visible to us in the external world, so too ideas, feelings, and sensations are translated by the spiritual eye, E-Y-E, into a colorful aura. As the physical world appears in color to the physical eye, So do spiritual beings appear to the spiritual eye in a wonderful display of scintillating colors, but in a higher region. The spiritual world displays an amazing mobility of colors. We see people surrounded by an oval body of light in which they are swimming. This oval body is not at rest, but appears as if flowing and streaming, and then loses itself a certain distance from the physical body. In the space of Devakan, which constantly appears in movement, the human being has a fundamental color. Enduring moods in a human being, also enduring character, peculiarities, are revealed in the aura through an enduring coloring formed by clouds, which these colors stream through in the form of waves. We see wave-shaped streams moving through the aura from below to above. We see them shoot through like lightning. They move through the aura as bluish-red, brownish-red, and beautiful bluish colors. We see the most manifold in various colors, which change according to various causes. You can go into a church and observe the auras of the devoted souls. You will find there entirely different color tones, than you find in a gathering of people in which political passions or human egotism makes itself felt. The soul moods that our daily needs bring us, you will see streaming forth as forms of brick red and carmine red. Sometimes they will have a darker, nuanced color. And if you go into a church and observe people filled with devotion, then you see an interplay of blue, indigo, violet, and rose red. If you investigate the auras of people who live in a thought world, 
contemplating scientific problems, then you will see thought forms shining forth from within their aura. These thought forms reflect thoughts that reveal in their aura that there are no passions shooting through them. When we learn what the aura shows us, then on one hand we can read the moods and temperaments living in people and see what is reflected in their consciousness. On the other hand, we can also see reflected all their thoughts, from the most everyday up to the highest, most spiritual, up to feelings of devotion to the divine and the loftiest compassion. When starting out, we cannot separate anything, but gradually we learn to do this and notice that there are two sharply distinguished forms in the aura. First of all, there are cloud-like shapes with indeterminate outlines that stream in more from the periphery of the head. We learn to separate these cloud-like shapes from the phenomena that go forth more from the heart, chest, and head, and have a more radiant character. These radiations always proceed from an inner middle point. We learn to distinguish the cloud-like shapes from those having a radiant character. The cloud-like formations, which vary from brown into dark orange, come from the bodily nature, from the human lower nature, from passions and drives. Thus we distinguish in the aura the spiritual part from the lower, more astral part. We learn to distinguish the colors that appear most often. The auras of Europeans today are usually green-colored, often shading into yellow. This green represents the actual intellectual part, the conscious part. Thus it expresses the fundamental mood of the soul life of today's European. You can experience a strange perception with people who are in a trance. All green disappears from their aura. Anyone who can perceive the aura will have an easy time distinguishing between a person who is actually in a trance and someone who is pretending to be in one. So too, a doctor working in a clinic experimenting with hypnosis, something we regard as unacceptable, even though it sometimes happens, could ascertain clearly whether an experimental subject is being deceptive or whether the subject is really in a trance state. The green in the aura would disappear. The green tones disappear also in the case of someone who passes out, and they also always disappear from the aura of someone asleep. The first ability to be developed in a seer is the ability to see the human aura. Seers develop the ability to get this information about human beings relatively fast, and they learn to distinguish the astral aura from the mental aura. The radiating aura is from the world of Devakan. It is spirit and belongs to the part of a human being that continues to exist after death. It is what originates in our true spiritual home. What shifts from brownish into greenish in color belongs to the transitory part of the human being. We shed it with our physical sheath, or in Kamaloka, in order then to enter the actual spiritual world. It is a higher kind of perception, a higher kind of spiritual sense when the sense for Devakan opens. The Devakanic world is especially different from the physical world. The physical world is unmoving and dead, while the Devakanic world manifests a manifoldness and flexible mobility without comparison. It is an inwardly mobile world in constant movement. Now, students striving for a higher development must learn to find their way within this world of Devakan. When we perceive in the world of physical things, the things remain as they are, and our ideas of them are formed according to the things. The table and chair remain still. They do not adjust themselves according to my ideas, but rather my ideas must adjust themselves according to the table and the chair. This is not the case in the spiritual world. There is nothing in Devakan that holds still. And for this reason, those who enter Devakan have an enormous responsibility. Thoughts in the external physical world are only a shadow of reality compared with thoughts in Devakan. The actual real thoughts do not live in our brain. 
What appears in our consciousness is not a shadow picture or reflection, but rather a being that lives in Devakan. In truth, our thoughts are beings that belong in the spiritual world. When you grasp a thought, you bring about a change in the world of Devakan. In order to make this clear, I would like to show you an example of what happens in the world of Devakan when you grasp a thought. Those whose senses have been opened to Devakan see not merely the shadows of thoughts, but rather the being of the thought itself as an actual object. Imagine you are harboring some thought or another, say a thought concerned with another person. The thought is visible for a seer. The thought rays forth as a wave of light from a light source. And just as light streams forth in all directions from a flame, so too does the thinking human being stream forth in all directions. And as light spreads in the physical world, so too do the rays of thoughts ray out into the world of Devakan, so that we can actually see thoughts raying forth from every human being. For this reason, you will understand why Christ is portrayed with a crown of light rays. That is not a fantasy of any kind, but rather it corresponds to a perception in higher perceiving. When thoughts ray forth, they begin in space and spread in space the same way light rays forth in space. Let us consider a specific thought. If this thought is conceived so that it is focused on you, so that it concerns only you, then it rays forth only in that way. But if it is concerned with another person, then in Devakan it behaves just as light does when it encounters an object and is reflected back. And just as an object appears illuminated by light, so also the individual involved appears illuminated by the world of thought. If someone sends out a thought related to another person, for example a wish for the other person to be healthy, then we can see this thought radiating and spreading out in all directions. But this thought directed toward one person does not simply stream through devakonic space. It seeks to be realized in the space immediately surrounding the person. This thought then streams to the person with whom it is connected. These are processes such as you can see in the world of Devakan. You can perceive how lofty human thoughts are caught up in Devakanic space and are formed into a kind of flower form, into beautiful geometric figures such as are not present on earth. Although it may appear to be fanciful, this is all genuine reality for those who can observe in Devakan. Those who learn to move around in Devakan learn to send out their thoughts in a conscious way and are aware of the harvest they will have through these thoughts. They learn that every thought in Devakan is a fact and they endeavor to bring forth only beneficial effects with their thoughts. Those who have not been initiated send their thoughts at random into Devakan while initiates have learned to give their thoughts form. That is what gradually happens as an esoteric student progresses. I would still like to draw your attention to something remarkable. The last time I spoke about the fact that in Devakan there are two departments, so to speak. There is a lower department, Rupa Devakan, which is the world of the Devakonic continents, the Devakonic sea, and the Devakonic atmosphere. These are fundamentally permeated through and through by feelings. Then I described the Akashic matter, the pure etheric matter of Devakan. Those are all the lower regions of Devakan. Then come the three higher regions of Arupa Devakan. The highest spiritual beings, the Dhyana Chohans, the spirits of the planets, and so forth, stay in these higher regions. The beings we know as Mahatmas, the spiritual leaders of humanity, also belong to these higher spiritual beings. These beings have achieved such an elevated stage of evolution that they can teach the rest of humanity the great truths of existence. Those human beings whose devakonic senses have opened, who are in a position to observe in devakon, are also able to converse with these advanced human spirits. They learn to understand the language in which these spirits communicate, and they also learn how to speak to them, 
They are then obliged to translate the messages received in this way into everyday language. Teachings translated in this way are what we proclaim as theosophical truths. These truths originally came down to us from our highly developed human brothers and sisters. They were then conveyed to us by suitably qualified individual personalities. After we have learned to, in quotes, read, we understand the most ancient eternal secrets of the world. In order to translate them into everyday language, we must learn to look up to these sublime spirits, the masters, which we in theosophy call Mahatmas. It is particularly interesting to observe how a chela relates to these masters in the world of Devakan. I have already described how thoughts in Devakan behave, how they stream forth to fulfill their destiny. That is not the case, or not in the same way, with thoughts that a chela sends upward in devotion to the masters or mahatmas in order to inquire about information concerning the deepest truths. The thought that the chela sends up to the spiritual leaders follows a very special path, different from that of ordinary thoughts. It is as if the thought did not stream fully up to the goal of its intent. This thought, this call for knowledge concerning higher worlds, at first streams into the region that I have called the Akasha region. Then the thought turns and returns to the student, but not the same way it ascended, but rather enriched and glowing with what comes forth from the Master. This is how it is to be understood when it is always stressed that the Master is the higher self of the human being. In a certain way our own thoughts speak to us when we enter into conversation with these more highly evolved human spirits. Nothing foreign to us should be transferred into us. The Masters do not want to make us into slaves in spirit. For this reason the Masters do not send us their thoughts but our own, so that we recognize that it is the substance that we ourselves have let stream forth. These are individual processes, which those experience who are in a position as incarnated beings, between birth and death, to move about within Devakan. It is those whose sense for Devakan has already been opened here in a bodily nature those who can lift their spirit out of the shell of their bodily nature. We also find in Devakan lower beings in great number who are present there as regular inhabitants. These are beings who are disembodied for a short while, that is, those who stand between two incarnations. People spend a long time in Devakan between two incarnations. Today I have described the experiences that those who are still embodied can have in Devakan. The next time I would like to describe to you what those experience who are embodied in Devakan, that is the course of our stay in Devakan between two lives, that will supplement our view in an essential way. And if you then add that picture to the one I have provided today, you will have the ability to understand the world of Devakan in clear pictures. You will understand much of what initiates are really saying, without its being expressed in ordinary daily usage or in our literature. Until the 19th century, initiates have always spoken in hints and allusions. The allusions have always been understandable for those whose sense has been opened for them. For those who know the world of causes, for them the words of an initiate, who is usually not recognized as one, for instance Goethe, are properly understood. Goethe himself said that much was, in quotes, secreted. Uh, German is hin ein Geheimnist. Into the second part of his Faust, which only initiates would understand. In mythical, clear language, he pointed out what the earthly sense perceptible is for him. The earthly points to a higher world, of which it is the expression. If we understand this properly, then we will know that Goethe, as an initiate of higher knowledge, drew from the suprasensory world. Then we understand what he was saying with the words, quote, everything transitory is but a parable. The unattainable becomes an event here. The indescribable is done here.
close quote. The Theosophical Society wants to describe gradually what many have held as, in quotes, indescribable. In the lectures concerning the astral world, I have tried to describe the path that the human soul must traverse after passing through the gate of death. This path through the soul world, or the astral world as it is called in theosophical literature, is relatively short. The longest period of time that the soul spends between one incarnation and the next is spent in the spiritual world, in what in theosophy is called Devakan, the land of gods. In order to use a German expression, I will use the term spirit land, Geist Erland. We need to take care that we gradually introduce German expressions. And if we realize that we mean nothing other than Devakan, when we say spirit land, then we will be able to understand one another. In the astral world, the soul will have to purify itself of everything that chains it to the earthly, of drives, passions, and instincts that are necessary for earthly life. However, it is impossible for the human soul to advance through Devakan with these earthly passions clinging to it. After it has freed itself from all that, it moves on through actual spirit land. If we want to understand what it means to move through spirit land, then this must be very clear. I have often stressed that theosophy in no way turns its back on earthly life, in no way points people toward any kind of, in quotes, other side to reality. On the contrary, it clearly states that the chief task of human beings during the course of their incarnation is found here, on earth. That it is the task of a human being to perfect more and more this earthly existence, our task is to bring what we experience in the spiritual world as fruit into the earthly sphere. We are to apply to our earthly lives what we observe in the time between two incarnations. For this earthly incarnation, our task and the task of the earth is to become so perfected that what has been perfected can be carried up into higher kingdoms. It is our task to work together on the perfecting of the earth, because according to the cosmic plan, this earth is not to remain as it is. It is to become a higher world. And human beings are to bring about what will enable the earth to be taken into a higher world. For this reason, from time to time, they must return to spirit land. Human beings should work on the earth in order to lead it to its goal, which is spiritual. For this they must make themselves capable of working spiritually. Again and again they must return to the spiritual world and live purely spiritually in order to learn and work with the goals and intentions for earthly life. We carry into earthly life what we learn in the spiritual world. Just as when a house is being built, the first and most important thing does not take place at the work site, where the bricks and boards are assembled, but rather in the architect's office, where the blueprints are thought through and prepared. Just as the carpenters and masons translate into reality what the architect thought out beforehand, what is most important for us is what we bring down from the suprasensory world, the goals, intentions and plans we receive in order to apply them in the world of objects and bodies. Yet what human beings do during earthly incarnation is very important. From time to time the spirit withdraws in order to get to know the actual foundations of earthly existence. That is the meaning of our stay in Devakan or spirit land. When we leave our body at death, we first must pass through a condition of unconsciousness, we pass through the astral world, and then finally awaken in spirit land. Then we must apply what we learned through what we practiced in the earthly world. Staying with the same picture, we must imagine that we work like an architect who is creating a plan and drawings for a house. 
Once the architect has made a plan, he also learns, through the physical material realization of the plan, about the imperfections, the mistakes within it. He is a learner. In the same way we are learners during our incarnation. In exactly the same way that an architect learns from experiences and observations made while designing his first building and then uses them for later structures, so too we transform our experiences and observations into a more perfect knowledge. Then, enriched by this knowledge, we enter into new incarnations. That is the meaning of it. Between death and a new birth, we awaken from a kind of unconsciousness in Devakan. Then we must advance through various stages. In each of these stages, a very specific kind of ability is developed. We have learned of seven stages. I will briefly mention each of these once again and indicate what the spirit must achieve at each stage. I have explained how the lowest region is the kingdom of archetypes but this is to be understood pictorially. It is a condition. In this world we encounter the archetypes for everything that comes to meet us in the sensory world. I have said that in the spirit world we live within the spirit, just as we live within the sense world with our senses, and we feel the spiritual world just as we feel in the sense world with our senses, as we see and hear the sense world. What is present in the physical world as a thought is a living being within the spiritual world. What passes through our head as a thought is only the shadow of a spiritual being. This spiritual being appears to us as a thought because it must penetrate through the veil of our physical bodily nature. We imprint the world with our thoughts and mental pictures and with and through them we make the earth more perfect. In the spiritual world, we must move among and between these thoughts, which have now become things. Just as here on earth we roam between physical things that we bump into and touch, so too in spirit land we roam between thoughts. The archetypes for the sense world are to be found in the lowest region of spirit land. There we are in the, in quotes, workshop, in which sensory things are, in quotes, made. We see there the archetypes for physical plants, animals, and human forms. Here we must form thoughts about what we have seen. These thoughts are held in the background as shadow-like schematics, and we do not believe in the reality of thoughts because they have such a shadow-like existence. Just as the clock was created by first having its inventor think the clock in his head, so everything has been created according to thought, and the, in quotes, thought being appears to us in spirit land. Thus in spirit land, the entire sensory world that we see here on earth appears to us in its archetypes. There we see everything as it is made. We see plants and animals springing forth from the animal and plant-creating forces. We learn to see what is here on earth from a different side. We see the spiritual negative, so to speak, as compared to the positive physical appearance. We are entering into a world the description of which must appear as fantasy to those who have little feeling for it. However, for those whose senses have been awakened for it, This world is infinitely more real than the physical world. It is the world of archetypes, the world of causes. A spiritual transformation occurs that grows stronger and stronger the more we become at home in this world. I would like to characterize the path through this world. It is significant because it casts a light on this world, a light of unspeakable significance. Our own bodily nature, our body, which we call ours, appears to us as a thing among things. It appears to us as belonging to external reality. We can see how it comes about and how it passes away. 
the archetype of our body, appears to us as a member within external reality. We feel ourselves standing over and in contrast to it. We no longer say of our body, quote, that is what I am, close quote. Rather, we know that it belongs to objective reality, and we come to understand a statement from the highest Hindu Vedanta wisdom, quote, you must recognize that you yourself are a member of the great all, close quote, quote, that is you, close quote. What forms our body, we see in such a way as if we stepped onto a boulder. It is something entirely foreign. We learn from experience to understand the sentence, quote, that is you, close quote. And when we practice this sentence, it is nothing more than the memory of what we have experienced earlier in spirit land. We are bringing this memory into our consciousness and experiencing a weak echo of the spirit world in the world of objects and bodies. But that lifts us up out of the sense world and into higher spheres. We feel ourselves to be spiritual beings. We know that we are a member of the primal spirit, a ray streaming forth from it. We know this immediately, directly. The second fundamental principle of Vedanta wisdom is also fulfilled immediately in the first region of Devakan, quote, I am Brahman, close quote. The primal spirit is intended with the word Brahman. When human beings have advanced enough to experience themselves as a member of this primal spirit, then they say, quote, the primal spirit lives in me. It is itself my being, close quote. Quote, I am the primal spirit. Close quote, is an immediate experience that the soul has already in the lowest region of spirit land. That is the meaning of life in the first region of Devakan. I have described the second region as the one in which all the archetypes of life on our earth are to be found. When we observe life in our earthly world, we find the same archetypes built into individual beings, in plants, in animals, and in human beings. The life of these plants, animals, and human beings is, however, a great living unity. It originates in the same common source. The archetype of the life that here on earth lives as a reflection or distant echo streams there like an ocean through all the beings of the spirit kingdom. The occultist knows that this streaming life has a rose-red color, a rose-red ocean, so to speak. It streams through all beings of spirit land. This streaming, rose-red, fluid life pulses through all life in spirit land. After human beings have advanced through the first region of spirit land, they then identify themselves with this flowing life on the second stage. They learn to know their being as flowing life. In order to understand this fully, let us once again make clear what it means to live in this region in the time between death and a new birth. We live for an especially long time in the first region of Devakan. In the physical world we are born into very specific conditions, determined by the physical nature of the earthly world. We are born into a country, into a family, so that we acquire certain friends through physical connections. Through physical conditions we connect with something that constitutes the content of our everyday life. Life in a family, life in a clan, in a nation. That is karma. In the first region of spirit land we learn about everything that originates in physical relationships, in its archetypes. We also learn how to judge it. And the abilities that we acquire through practice in family life, as friendships and so forth, are completely formed and shaped in the first region of Devakan. They are intensified and formed so that we can return to the earth and a new incarnation with them increased and fully formed. For this reason we find that people who comprehend their whole mission only in the conditions and relationships of daily life, who do not move beyond their immediate environment, beyond their business and so forth, such people spend a long time in the first region of Devakan. 
Those people who bring a certain preparation with them reside in the second region of Devakan. This preparation is created through a higher education within earthly life. These people learn that the things of earthly life are transitory and merely expressions of an eternal primal ground of existence. They learn to recognize the oneness in all life and to look up with devotion to the One. When the simplest primitive person sees divine characteristics in objects and regards them as symbols of the divine, such an experience of the earth goes above and beyond everyday conditions. In this region human beings learn to recognize the creative work of the Godhead. Here we see the adherents of various religions developing devotional feelings by approaching the gods in humility. After human beings have passed through this region, they enter their next incarnation with a higher degree of devoutness. People who have a sense for the unity that underlies everything we see spend a long time in this second region. We see them living into the unity of all being, and we see how these spirits become leading religious personalities when they return to the earth. These people see that the interests of the individual can no longer be separated from the interests of the community. This sense for community life is developed in the second region of Devakan. Let us ascend into the third region. Here we no longer find archetypes for what lives only in earthly existence. Rather, we find the archetypes of soul existence itself. Here we find the archetypes of all desires and instincts, all sensations and feelings, and all passions, from the lowest passion up to the highest pathos. There are purely spiritual archetypes for all of that in the third region of Devakan. Just as all life in the second region forms a great unity, so too in the third region all sensations, feelings, all suffering and so forth form a great unity. There the instincts of one being are not separated from the instincts of another being. Here, quote, that is you, close quote, has already happened. We can no longer distinguish between my feeling and your feeling, as we can in the limited conditions of sense existence. The pain of another is just as much ours. We perceive, quote, the sighing of all nature, close quote. We perceive every pleasure and discomfort, whether it is ours or someone else's. We say to everything, that is you. We have compassion for everything. I have described this region as the atmosphere, as the air of the spirit world. Just as our earth is surrounded by a physical atmosphere, so also the spirit continent is surrounded by this atmosphere of air, by the sphere of suffering and unhappiness, by the archetypes of human passions, just like storms and lightning strikes and thunderstorms. When we live in the third region of Devakan, we learn to understand the sentence spoken by an inspired individual and know what it means when one is united with the, quote, groaning of all creatures who wait anxiously for adoption, close quote. This creates in us another side of feeling. We learn to know earthly feelings from another side, not as the egotistical feeling of an individual, but rather in such a way that we will have developed compassion for all beings in this third region. In this region we remember the selflessness and goodwill toward our fellow human beings that we developed on earth. That is what we bring with us from this third region. Philanthropists, the great benefactors of humanity, develop their capacity there. They have a long life in the third region of Devakan. How do these three regions of Devakan relate to our earthly world? In the first region, we find the archetypes of things that have bodies. In the second region, we find the archetypes of life. In the third region, we find the archetypes of our soul world, the drives, instincts, and passions. In spirit land, we find what we need in order to work within earthly life. The fourth region is a kind of pure spirit land, 
but not in the full sense of the word. If we wish to understand the difference between the fourth region and the lower three, we must be clear that we are dependent upon everything already present upon the earth when we bring creative forces into the physical world. We are like potters who imprint their ideas into the clay. When we wish to bring messages from spirit land, we are dependent upon the clay of the earthly world. We must adjust ourselves to what has already been created. We must study what already exists in the physical world as physical matter and physical forces. We must respect what our co-creatures feel in terms of suffering and happiness or unhappiness. With what we bring from the spirit land, we must conform to what we find here. Here we create only a picture, an imprint of what is found in spirit land. In the fourth region, we find the archetypes for what human beings create that is original, what they create that goes beyond what already exists. We find as an archetype in the fourth region of Devakan everything brought forth by art and science, everything that we know as technical inventions, everything that would not exist without the influence of the human spirit. All those human beings who participate in the advancement of the culture of their age, who strive for science, who work to perfect state institutions, who work to perfect what has been born freely from the spirit and is not bound to the soul, they are all fructified by what they experienced in the fourth region of Devakan. What we experience there we imprint into the reality accessible to the senses and thereby transform it. If we ask ourselves if this fourth region is independent from the earthly region, then we must answer that in a certain way it is, because a human being who comes from there brings something that does not yet exist. But then, on the other hand, the fourth region is independent, because human beings can stand only at a certain stage of perfection, and they can form only that for which humanity is ready. The fourth region of Devakan is connected with earthly existence in such a way that on the one hand it is free of it, and on the other hand it is dependent on the developmental stage of earthly existence. If we ascend to the fifth region of spirit land, then we are entirely free from the chains of earthly existence. Then we are free on all sides and able to evolve. Then we are surrounded by what is our actual, true, real home. In this higher region we discover the actual intentions that the world spirit has for earthly evolution. We participate in the intentions of the world spirit. Then everything begins to speak to us. We find out the divine world spirit's aim for the plants, for the animals, and for human beings. We learn to recognize the perfected forms for which creation is merely an imperfect copy. Here we come to know the intentions, the goals that stream forth from eternity. And when we return strengthened to the physical world, we are messengers of these divine intentions. Then we bring what should be inserted into the earthly world as true spirit, as independent spirit. Now you can easily imagine that what we can bring back from this region will depend upon how much we have developed ourselves during our incarnations in our physical lives. If human beings have no intention to raise themselves up to higher worlds, if they are stuck in everyday life and cannot grasp what is eternal, then they will experience nothing more than a brief glimpse in the fifth region of Devakan. And those who are not dependent on earthly life, who reflect on the earthly condition with independent thought, who practice deeds of compassion and benevolence without egotistical interests, those people have acquired the right to abide in the higher regions of Devakan for a longer period of time. They are able to develop independent spiritual activity in a higher sense. 
what flows forth from the divine, from eternity, streams to them there. The human self takes up into itself the world of thought unlimited by earthly imperfection. Every incarnation is only an imperfect copy of what a human being actually is. The spiritual self is in spirit land, and when it descends into a human body and soul, it can realize only a weak copy of what it actually is. When we return home to our true selves, to our original unique spiritual wholeness, when we come to know the fifth region, then our view of our own incarnations is expanded. We are in a position to survey our past and future. We experience a flash of memory of our past incarnations, and we can connect them with what we can do in the future. We can see the past and the future with prophetic vision. Everything we behold appears to us as if flowing forth from our eternal self. This is what the self acquires in the fifth region of spirit land. For this reason we label this self inasmuch as it lives in the fifth region and becomes aware of its own being, the bearer of causality of the human being, which carries all the results of previous lives over into the future. What appears in the various incarnations is the causal body. Indeed, it will appear for as long as and until the human being passes over into a higher state where higher laws than reincarnation apply. We have been subject to the laws of reincarnation since the beginning of planetary life. The causal body is what carries the results of previous lives over into the upcoming life. It enjoys the fruits of previous lives, that is, what was achieved through work in a previous lifetime. After a series of such earthly pilgrimages, when the actual spiritual self, that is the causality bearer, has incarnated in the physical body, it then lives in spirit land in such a way that it can freely move around just as a physical human being moves among things in the sensory world. That is the experience one can create there. We learn to move about in a way that shows much more initiative and appears much higher than movement within the world of the senses. Then we move up to the sixth region of Devakan, when we have achieved the right to spend certain periods of time between lives in the sixth region. In the sixth region the human self already expresses the deeper being within it. There its eternal self finds complete expression. There it expresses what comes directly from the very depths of the Divine Self. There the human being learns to be just as much at home in spirit land as a physical human being feels at home in the physical world. We become so familiar with the laws of the spiritual world that we regard ourselves as belonging to that world. In this sixth region, we learn that we come into this physical world as a messenger of the pure divinity. We no longer find the reasons for our work in the physical world within the physical world itself. We fulfill the plans of the divine world order itself. We create out of the spiritual world. We work out of the spiritual world. For this reason we are not strangers on the earth, Neither do we work as strangers. We have acquired independent impartiality in this sixth region. When we appear in the physical world as a messenger of the spiritual world, our work is all the more fruitful because we are not dependent upon the things of this world and because we judge them with complete objectivity we will do what is right. Our deeds will be deeds of the spiritual world, order itself, an expression, a revelation of the divine world order itself. In this sixth region of spirit land, we also enjoy the company of those lofty beings I spoke of the last time. 
These are beings who work with us on the plane of the divine world order. Their view of divine wisdom is spread out, open, and unveiled. Human beings who have developed themselves up to the sixth region can understand here what these beings are saying to them concerning the divine world plan. When they return to the earthly plane, they are able to determine for themselves the direction and goals of their life. Then they are acting out of themselves. They can consciously work into the future. They are capable of becoming initiates here on this earth. Those who have performed deeds on earth unconnected to egotism, deeds of self-sacrifice, are able to become initiates. They have earned the right to live in the presence of spirits between incarnations, and they are entrusted with the forces and the riches of spirit land. When they then return to incarnation, their memories are open to earlier incarnations. They see that they have lived here or there and they determine the future of their next incarnation, even if not in all details, for that cannot be determined. Those who have experienced these things in spirit land between two incarnations are the aspirants for initiation into the mysteries. These are the ones who are taken into the secret schools and discover there the wisdom they are to proclaim to the world so that they can follow the path of advancement. These are the ones who can affirm out of their own personal experience that the teachings of theosophy are factual and true. But they are also the ones who have the duty to proclaim to others the irrevocable truths they have received. They have the duty to ignite the lofty feeling and the power that carry us further up the ladder of knowledge. Those who are able to believe in reincarnation know that this knowledge is possible. They have already reached the first step. Even those whose faith in the possibility of reincarnation is dull and weak can expect that this faith will become knowledge of reality, for faith works as a living force in the human soul and produces miracles in the human soul. What comes from spiritual depths works in the human soul. Those who do not know this refer to others as dreamers, because they are not aware that these others are creating out of a much deeper consciousness than they are themselves. But the progress of the world is an ongoing incarnation of what these dreamers and idealists have thought. The seventh step can be reached only by those who have been initiates in this life, those who have grasped the meaning of the mysteries and who can be co-workers of the structure and plan of the divine world order. After they have fulfilled their tasks in the lower regions, they enter directly into the highest region where all impulses for life and streams of existence flow. Only initiates have the right to enter this seventh step of Devakan, or spirit land. We have seen that the tasks of the human being lie in this earthly world, that we are not allowed to withdraw from it, But what lies in this earthly world must be fructified by the experiences that we have in the land of spirits and that we recognize as messages with instructions that we are to carry out in earthly life. In order for us to work with certainty, we must regard life as a school. We must make life into a lesson. We must learn to recognize how the rays of a higher life flow into the world of earth. We will speak more about this next time. Today it is incumbent upon me to bring these lectures concerning the so-called Devakan plane or spirit land to an end. When you read in theosophical literature about Devakan or the land of spiritual beings, the description you will find is that it is a region of peace a region of blessedness. You are told that Devakan is a, quote, land of delight, close quote. Now, dear listeners, it is very easy to misunderstand such a description and imagine something entirely false from these words. It is clear that very many people do not know what the happiness of Devakan actually is. The vast majority of people seek happiness and peace 
in things that are simply not to be found in Devakan. Even the picture that people paint for themselves of paradise, using religious pictures and ideas, using their imagination of the land of happiness and joy, even that is so very much attached to ideas and mental pictures of our immediate sensory reality. It is created using mental pictures taken from our bodily surroundings, images that we are not allowed to apply to the land of spiritual beings. What people hope for in terms of paradisiacal joys, what they call paradise derived from the sensory mental pictures, is found already in the fifth region of Kamaloka, the fifth region of the purging fire. And indeed, precisely with the goal of stripping away their addiction to sensual joys and sensual desires. For example, what American Indians imagined as a paradisiacal hunting ground where they could indulge all their desires to hunt, they find already in the fifth region of Kamaloka. This is precisely what human beings must be cleansed of before they can enter into the world of spirit. On the other hand, there are those who, when they hear that nothing of what we experience on earth as sensory reality is present in spirit land, say that spirit land is nothing other than an illusion, a kind of dream that we dream between two incarnations. Both these views need to be corrected. This will require that the concepts and mental pictures that we experience directly in reality be led over to entirely different and loftier mental pictures. We can acquire a corresponding idea of this higher reality, of what is actually meant, with the concept of the land of joyful blessedness, the land of blissful happiness and spiritual satisfaction that we experience between two incarnations if we listen to what the disciples of the great masters can tell us based on their experience already in this life. Those who achieve initiation in this life have already experienced something of this heavenly bliss, of this true spiritual satisfaction through their glimpse into the spirit land. You will ask, quote, is there or has there ever been something that can be called initiation? Were there really students in our Western culture who participated in this highest vision which opens for us spirit land? Close quote. It has always been possible to receive initiation in secret schools, in occult schools. A stream of occult wisdom came to Europe in the 14th century. This stream, which is called Rosicrucian, was misunderstood by many. It must necessarily be misunderstood by all who come to know it only from the outside. Only those may come to know it who do so from within, whose view has been obtained through an esoteric training. When Christian Rosenkreutz brought the wisdom of the East to Europe, he founded schools in which students were brought up to the stage where vision in Devakan, vision of the higher secrets, became possible. Only those who have themselves acquired such schooling can say anything about it. None of the external research found in books can tell you anything of it. Until the year the Theosophical Society was founded, in 1875, absolutely nothing of these matters was spoken about, except in these secret places of instruction. Only since 1875 did the Masters of Wisdom feel the duty to convey more widely some of these deepest spiritual truths. Even today initiations still occur. They can take place only within spirit land, the region I described. Today every person to be initiated must arrive at these higher secrets, him or herself, on the plane of Devakan. This makes it necessary to give at least some idea of how a person feels and is transformed who receives initiation on the Devakanic plane. People who have experienced initiation are in a position to see those lofty beings I have described to you, who come from entirely different worlds, in order to enjoy their incarnation, at first in Devakan, and then descend into the lower regions, into the three worlds. Those who achieve initiation then begin to acquire an entirely new faith, an entirely new vision. They have really become different persons, 
They behold with their spiritual eye, E-Y-E, what is not even present for most other people living in the same environment, things the existence of which the others have not even a suspicion. Allow me to give a short outline of the confession of faith that those who are initiated make their own. This outline is already known to you in several different forms. Some part of all deeper truths has always found its way into the public arena and even propagated exoterically in the public consciousness. Those to be initiated acquire a higher view of what happens in our physical reality. They acquire this view by placing themselves outside this physical reality. During our life in the world of the senses, we are enclosed in our bodily organization and can see only with our eyes, hear with our ears, perceive through our other sense organs. We are dependent upon what our senses convey to us. This ends through the higher schooling that an initiate receives. As a beginning, the initiate sees before himself, I can only describe it like this, his own physical reality fully displayed. One sees oneself, just as one would see any other object in the immediate surroundings of our sensory reality. That is how we see our own physical bodily nature when we have been initiated. Our organism lies before us as our own corpse. But also we see our astral body, our desires, instincts, our entire life of desire based on the senses. And we then speak in terms of the Vedanta wisdom, quote, that is you, close quote. We see ourselves with complete objectivity, with all our faults, with all that we have achieved through the various incarnations. It is what was described to you as the passage through the gate of death that everyone to be initiated must pass through. What we usually see in the sense world around us, we see no more. We see in the world around us from the point of view of spirit land, not from the point of view of the senses. We see too in the world of instincts, in the world of kama, of passions, in the world where human drives are to be found. We see what brings people into conflict and discord, what brings them joy, what brings them pleasure in this physical reality. We look into these things the way a hiker would stand on a high mountain and look into the surrounding mountainous landscape. And because we have elevated ourselves above sensuality, because we are surrounded by a world of pure spirit, for these reasons we see from the other side the beings of a spiritual nature and we perceive something of what is called divine wisdom. Divine wisdom itself is the father spirit of all religions. No one can behold him in his essential being, in his own form. The highest being remains unrevealed, even to opened spiritual eyes. But an initiate does get an idea of what creates and works in the world and is led before the creating divine forces. Then for the first time, the initiate speaks the word out of conviction, out of immediate intuition, the word that was previously taught to him by faith, quote, I am Brahman, close quote. When the initiate is led through the narrow portal where physical and astral life are displayed objectively, then the word of an initiating priest sounds forth, quote, to those who already have, much will be given, and from those who already have not, will be taken that which they already have, close quote. That is the verse of initiation heard at the first portal of initiation. You will find it also in the Bible, along with many other sayings taken from Egyptian priest wisdom. Those who already have are those for whom the Spirit has already awakened the ability to feel spiritually, sense spiritually. However, those who approach this portal and have no faith and no sense for the Spirit those people will have their longing for spiritual knowledge taken away. Woe to those who come to this place unworthily, who have forced their way out of curiosity. A different voice sounds forth to them, which once again has a symbolic significance. We then experience the universal spirit, the universal soul. 
we human beings reflect upon sensory things. However, the spirit that lives in us, which we experience within ourselves as thoughts and forms the object of our reflection, that is the same as the wisdom out of which the world was formed. We could not know the world with its laws unless the world itself was formed from these very same spiritual laws. Theosophy teaches that what lives in the human being as spirit is co-essential with what lives in the great universe, with Mahat. Manas in the human being draws wisdom from Manas in the universe, from Mahat. Or are we to believe that the laws that we see at work in the heavens, according to which the heavenly bodies move, has significance only in our minds? Mahat of the starry sky is the intellectual or element of reason outside in the great world. And what you experience of it is manas, the intellectual or reason element in the small world. Now the universal spirit descends upon the one to be initiated. The initiating priest speaks the words, quote, This is my much-loved son, with whom I am well pleased. Close quote. The individual who is now initiated knows what the spirit of the world is. Then he can express his faith in the creative world spirit out of his own conviction and say, quote, I believe in the Divine Father Spirit, who made the spirit that is also called divine, who also made the bodily world, the earthly. Close quote. In the Christian profession of faith, it is stated thus, I believe in God, the Almighty Father, who created heaven and earth. And then one thing is clear to us, that in truth and reality, we have our origin from the same universal world spirit as we now encounter here in spirit land. We know that we have descended into the sensory physical world, but we also know that we have descended from divine worlds and from the spirit. We know that we have received the spiritual being within us from the heart of the Divine Father Spirit itself. We become aware of this as a real divine force, as something we experience and therefore have immediate certainty. We begin to acquire a new faith in humanity. Humanity becomes for us the only born Son, the Son concerning whom we say in our confession of faith, I believe in the divine origin of humanity, in the God in the human being itself, just as it is expressed in Egyptian priestly wisdom. Or we believe in the Christ in the human being, who has descended from heavenly worlds. And then it becomes clear to us that before this age of earthly development came to be, before this age in which we now live and in which we perceive through our senses, in which our sensual, sensory senses lead us to deeds, it becomes clear to us that before we descended into this sphere of the senses, we were in another purely spiritual sphere. Spiritual disciples have now come to know spirit land, and they know that this is the land in which human beings were located as only born sons of God. They know that the human being is born from virginal spiritual matter, Maria or Maya. And they know that the spirit man Christ is descended into the sensory world of matter. They know that this spirit man is contained in each one of us and is developed gradually through the various incarnations. They know that this spirit man lives surrounded by a sensory bodily nature that is in a physical body. The things of the external world work on our body in a sensory fashion. They form our eyes, our ears and the other sense organs. We live within this bodily sensuality and allow the world to permeate us, as if through windows we look through our sense organs upon the external world. We are enclosed in sensory matter and for this reason are limited by it. Christ who enters into human beings is pure and spiritual. He is virginal spiritual matter. Now he has descended into the condensed sensual sensory matter. Those who speak esoterically call this the waters or the sea. Thus we read in Genesis that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. This means that the Spirit hovered over matter, 
This matter is also called pontos pilatos in Greek, which literally means contracted or pulled together sea. The human being moved into this contracted sea, which has formed its organs. In this way, a being that was active in spirit land has become a being that receives impressions passively through sense organs from outside itself. The human being has become passive, a pontos pilatos. This is what distinguishes seeing in the spiritual world from seeing in the world of the senses. If we want to have an object before us in the spiritual world, then we first have a thought, and this thought is formed by the spirit in spirit land. That is, the human being finds the images for all creating in spirit land. In the sensory world we receive passively. We have all become passive beings, passive in condensed matter. This was the original confession of faith for the Egyptian priests. This is the symbol for Christ having descended to humanity, for his having taken on matter and passively suffered in the condensed pontos pilatos. In the course of time, this slipped into Christianity. Because the term pontos pilatos was fundamentally misunderstood, the misunderstood place in the Christian creed reads, quote, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Close quote, which is none other than the indicated place in the confessional creed of an Egyptian priest. The human being has become one who suffers, no longer active but rather passive. This is the article of faith that signifies in an occult symbol the fact of God becoming human. Once those to be initiated have recognized what is said in these deep truths, Then they look around at the objective sensory reality until they have become clear that they can once again descend into this sensuality in order to work in sensory reality out of duty and with devoted sacrifice of self. When they have advanced so far that they no longer seek to satisfy sensual drives but rather use these to work within the sensory world, then they are themselves initiates then they have the solid certainty that they can understand the universal justice prevailing in the world. Earlier they lived enclosed within the world of the senses, within the riddles of birth and death, of eternal life and of eternal becoming. Now they are clear that they are eternal, above birth and death. They see what is unchangeable, and at the same time the justice that rules the world, which we in theosophical language call karma. They have become wise to world justice. They can judge life and death, or as it is called by Egyptian initiates, birth and death. And now they believe in the lofty community of body-free spirits. We are separated only in the physical world. In Devakan we are a community of body-free spirits. The Christian confession of faith expresses this by saying, quote, I believe in the community of saints. Close quote. The Christian confession of faith grew out of the esoteric confession of Egyptian initiates, so that it speaks an entirely esoteric language. It is in part a translation of misunderstood symbols from esoteric sayings that the one to be initiated received as immediate knowledge in the land of Devakan. Now, through this description, it will have become a little clearer to you what is meant by the land of delight and blessedness. It is the blessedness of the unlimited, of eternal activity. Why can all of what oppresses us in the physical world no longer depress us in Devakan? Devakan is not the land of blessed happiness because we experience there delights such as human beings desire and demand in the world of the senses. It is rather because there we are free of anything connected with the body, free from what is required for sensual desires. And we are also free of the limitations that exist because they work on us from outside ourselves. What limits us in the physical world is removed. What can cause us pain is no longer present. For how does pain arise? 
It arises when impressions are made on our physical body or our astral body. We set aside these bodies when we are in Devakan. The reason for pain and feelings of discomfort in the physical world has fallen away. Because no one can be egotistical anymore. No one can long for egotistical joys anymore. Because no one has an astral body anymore. We are free from anything that could oppress our personality. For this reason, Devakan is known as the land of delight, the land of blessedness. I have said that just here in the third region of Devakan, every kind of pain is revealed to us, every kind of groaning of creation, everything that we can observe that takes place here on the earth in terms of pain and suffering. What unfolds as passion or desire is revealed to us but we perceived it the same way we perceive objects here in the world of the senses. It is a perception that is not so strong, not so shrill as to cause us pain. Neither is it the same as when we touch or feel a hot object and are burned. In Devakan, we perceive without feeling egotistical pain or personal desire. We behold the totality of all pain, all suffering, and we stand as spiritual beings above it and feel that we have to work to mitigate or reduce this pain. We are entirely indifferent as to whether this pain belongs to us or to others. Our personality is stripped away. The pain is no longer personal. The cause of personal pain arising within us has fallen away. Because we are disembodied, we are free from all that could oppress us. For this reason, Devakan is called the land of delight. For this reason, the blessedness in Devakan must be described as incomparable to anything that happens here in sensory reality. Only those who, as initiates, have both had experiences here in a physical sensory incarnation and have received knowledge and wisdom from Devakan know what these, in quotes, delights signify. Everything that we are told about Devakan comes from the experiences and the immediate observations of such initiates who have learned how to be active themselves within spiritual existence. These have also learned that it is the greatest illusion to speak of life in Devakan between two incarnations as an illusion. That is the real illusion, to regard life in Devakan as an illusion, as a dream. And in fact, all real life originates in Devakan. And only because it is the task of earthly existence to guide human beings and their spiritual activity down into the earthly world must Christ appear in a sensory incarnation, in a human being. For this reason, according to Plato, the greatest of Greek philosophers, is the world soul laid out in the form of a cross through the universe and stretched over the earthly world body. Plato said this. It is a symbol that an initiate understands in its deepest significance. Thus, just as a master craftsman needs instruments, needs tools, so also does the spiritual world need our physical existence in order for the spiritual world to be the master builder of the physical body. For example, a hammer could never have come into existence without the influence of spiritual reflection. It could never be used by a being who had nothing more than physical forces and could not think. Likewise, the human being could never fulfill its task unless it again and again ascends to spirit land to acquire there the forces needed to work in the physical world. Human beings ascend into a country where they receive pure spirituality, where they learn how to use spiritual forces without those forces becoming passive in the world of the senses, where they learn to unfold their wings freely in their actions. Then they can once again be incarnated, suffering in the condensed matter of spiritual existence, in the pontos piletos. Human beings journey from incarnation to incarnation, Again and again they enter into the pontos piletos. Again and again spirit is crucified in matter. 
Theosophists can never become materialists, not in the least. They cannot see the whole of existence in the physical world. And if they are in a position to make their own observations in the land of spirit, they will come to the insight that asceticism is the enemy of reality. In spirit land we come to understand what the human being as a spiritual being has for a task. The earthly world in which we live is our abode for the time of our present evolution. And we should use what we acquire in spirit land for the good of this earthly world. Again and again we are equipped with new assignments between two incarnations so that we can work on this earth. Honored listeners, we have now journeyed through the regions of the three worlds. There are three worlds in which we live, the earthly world, the soul world or the astral world, and the spiritual world or Devakan. The human being lives here in this existence in all three worlds. In every sensory, physical human being, there lives a soul human being and a spiritual human being. Of course, physical human beings have consciousness only in the world of the senses, but the astral and spiritual human being works in them also. Soul and spirit are at work in every human being. Consciousness awakens between incarnations and kamaloka in the land of soul. Then we become seeing, we are awakened between incarnations according to our level of development, according to what we bring from our earthly incarnation. We awake in Devakan, the land of spirit, in order once again to return to the astral world, in order to clothe ourselves with astral matter and then return to the physical world. This is the path, the pilgrimage of the human spirit. The human being originates in the land of spirit. When human beings still lived in pure spirit land, they formed for themselves bodies originally made from virginal matter. Long ago another kind of life lived on the earth and preceded our earthly condition. Then human beings were still pure spirit. Only spiritual reality was present there. Then the human being descended into astral existence, not yet as far as physical reality, and was at that time still Adam Kadmon, that pure spirit in which the world of drives and desires was not yet present. Then came what is so well expressed in Genesis symbolically, where we read that Jehovah formed the human being out of a lump of earth and blew into him living breath. The spirit received condensed sensory matter, and at the same time all earthly existence became sensory physical reality. Until then the human being had been in a kind of subconsciousness, the wakeful consciousness that we have today, this understanding with which we weigh and consider, and with which we orient ourselves in the physical world, came to us only when we descended into the world of the senses. We received lower sensory reality simultaneously with our power to reason. Again, this is symbolically represented in Genesis as the serpent, which gave humanity its earthly power to reason. The deepest point in human evolution is when birth and death occur, when the immortal part of the human being must always pass through the door of death. This will be eliminated in the next epoch, when the human being will be an astral being only. Then the final epoch will come when the human being will have only a spiritual existence. Thus we learn from our observation of Devakan how everything in the world, large and small, is evolving. How all existence comes from the spirit and passes through sensory reality in order to ascend once again into spirit. Observing these higher spiritual regions shows us that what we call death, what we call passing away, is nothing more than a transient, almost illusory condition of a single world epoch. It is not something that can have duration. The conviction, the clarity, the knowledge that human beings have come from higher regions and that they will once again ascend to higher regions gives us strength so that gradually, as we progress in theosophy, we can feel and imagine what Paul, an initiate of early Christianity, 
felt and expressed with the words, quote, Death, where is your sting? Close quote. On the other hand, one should never feel contempt for earthly existence. Just as bees bring honey into the beehive, so are we to draw honey from the earthly world and carry it up into the spiritual world. However, we find our way properly only when we know which forces of our existence are fundamental. For this reason I have held these lectures on the region of Devakan. One thing alone could move me to hold these lectures, which I realize can easily be misunderstood. That is a sentence written by the author of the basic theosophical book titled Light on the Path, quote, and when you have recognized the truth, you are not allowed to keep it for yourself. Close quote. And those who feel themselves called to speak must speak without respect to how they are received. The call from the spiritual world is higher than anything else once we have perceived it. This call awakens in us a consciousness that is entirely different from any consciousness that we may know in the sensory world. Then, from our view of the land of spirit, we can make a verse of Solomon's, our motto, quote, Therefore I prayed for insight, and it was given to me. I called upon God, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I treasure the truth higher than anything living in the kingdom of the senses around me. Close quote. A wise person treasures wisdom more highly than everything in the sensory kingdoms that exist all around him or her. Therefore, such a person will attempt to proclaim this wisdom. This should serve as a justification for what moved me to speak about this subtle region of existence, even though I know how these things can be misunderstood and how difficult it is to speak of these things in a language that is more or less understandable. But when one has heard this call, then one lets it sound forth in the sense of these words of Solomon's wisdom, 